So next, I think I will show, oh, I'll show you Pete Holly. I didn't bring too many, but. Oops. So there's something about Peter Holly's art that grabbed me immediately. It was so beautifully drawn, but I think he's a cartoonist at heart, and he's a brilliant designer. Those hands are really cool in that one. He did a lot of commercial work, greeting cards, record album covers. Um, he did the Janssen illustrations for a long time. And his work was rarely signed, so I had a big collection of it, and I still didn't know his name. Like, this one has a PH in the corner. Um, it's, I don't remember how, I mean, it might have been Howard Shake, and I, I don't remember who eventually told me um, who it was that was doing these things. The way he tilted her head back blows my mind. If you've ever tried to draw that, <laughs> you know how hard that is to make appealing. The shapes in the hair, the hands, it's, it's very alive. So I wanted to find out, when I, after I found out his name, I wanted to find him if he was still alive. And the way I finally found out um, was I saw an illustration that was obviously by him and it was signed Sedona like as a pen name so I typed I went on the internet this was maybe 15 years ago maybe more and I typed in um, Sedona Arizona I think maybe I did a people search in Sedona Arizona for Pete Holly and I found some Hollies and I called one of the numbers and I ended up talking to his daughter and Susan and found out that he had passed away um, just a couple years earlier and I had a really nice conversation with her. She talked about going into his studio after he passed away and playing the Sinatra records and um, it was, and I've done that many times where I've talked to families of artists that I admire and it's really nice to kind of give them a chance to sort of talk about their, their dad and, and to let them know that you know, that I, he's inspired me. And they generally really like to, to hear that, um, to know that people still know him and care about him. Those hands are great. I gave up long ago trying to think that I could draw like this. <laughs> Part of me still wants to, but I think maybe next life I'll give it a shot. <laughs> so I'm going to show you Roy Nelson. This is my favorite cartoonist. Oops. So I found out about Roy Nelson reading an interview with Ed Benedict in Animation Blast magazine. Um, Amita Meaty interviewed Ed, and Ed mentioned his two favorite cartoonists, Russell Patterson <coughs> and Roy Nelson. I didn't know Roy Nelson, but obviously now I need to know who that is. Um, and I went on the search, and I could not find a single thing. Nothing. Nothing in any of the history books, and I had a pretty big library of cartooning history, not a single mention. But in that interview, I think Ed mentioned that he had done illustrations for Esquire. So I went to the library, this was maybe eight years ago, and they had bound volumes of Esquire magazine, and I started going through them page by page, seeing, I mean, my heart was pounding with each illustration that I found, because this was everything that I'd been looking for in one artist. It had the design of Patterson. It had the appeal of animators like Freddie Moore, um, Mary Blair. It was, I almost, it felt like I had dream, dreamt him up. Like I didn't think anyone could capture so much of what I wanted in cartoons. But no one knew who he was. And part of the reasons for that were he, he was on the staff of a Chicago newspaper that went out of business in the 70s. And he left the paper when he was drafted in World War II. And so 
he'd been kind of forgotten about. And the Esquire stuff that he did, he only did for a few years in 30, like 1932 through, I think, 36. And there were t these illustrations are the size of a postage stamp in the magazine. And um, so when I found out that he had done work in the newspaper, I had started going to my local library, ordering microfilm, microfilm of the paper from Chicago, and I'd sit there and scroll through miles and miles and miles. And I would print out one when I'd find it at a quarter of a pop. It would come out all messed up. So if you've ever looked at microfilm, it's the worst possible way of archiving anything. But it was, you know, it was something. And I won't get into this, the crazy search that I went through trying to find out about him. I eventually um, corresponded with his sister, who was 99 years old. And she wrote me uh, a card that I treasure, um, thanking me for my interests and telling me how much she admired her brother. And happy, you know, I told her my intentions to do a book. And she was happy about that. Um, but he he blew my mind, and, and kind of in a in a way that took me over. I didn't want to draw in any other way except like Roy Nelson, and that's not a good thing. Like I mean, it was it, it inspired me, and it, but it kind of um, it just it sort of took took me over, and so I just started taking his symbols, like I did with Frazetta, like I did with Bruce Timm, like I did with with everybody, because it was the only way I could have any control. I didn't know how to draw me, myself, I, but I could steal these eyes. I could analyze mathematically his proportions, the way he composed things, the way he shaped things. He has also that essential element of just general weirdness to his work too. Like those horses are like no other horses that any other artist has drawn. Those are Roy Nelson horses, those aren't anybody else's. I imagine as you look at these, you'll see it in my book. You'll see the way he grounds that with that, that abstract black shape at the bottom. That hat and the bow, the way that's behind her face. The way those arms are huge <laughs> and the upper body is tiny. It's shape and contrast, but it's got so much attitude. The way her skirt is stretched between her knees and that arm is resting on the skirt. This is one that I printed out from, my, from microfilm and spent hours in Photoshop removing all the lines and specks. And then I put a layer of pulpy paper over the top of it just to kind of give it a little more warmth that was sucked out from the, the microfilm. No one else was drawing like this at this time. He had guys like maybe John Held, but Held tended, tended to be a little more flat, very 2D. Roy's stuff is flat but it has volume, like Ed Benedict. If that makes, I don't know how to explain that. And the way he composed that with the shapes in the house and the tree, it reminds me of Frazetta. Those, there's a great Frazetta illustration of this big cat looking down on a village, a house, surrounded by these trees. And I, I see that in Roy's work a lot. He did a lot of caricature. It looks so modern to me. And the eye is almost always the emphasis on his work. And to me, it's the most essential element in just about any drawing is, are the eyes. It's the first thing I, that pops out to me. I love the way he distorted the perspective on this. It's like we kind of forced three point so that you can see the top of that piano and up the staircase. It's just so cute. That, that girl on the, in the, I don't know, was that a photo or what that is? The way he's holding her and her hair is falling. Mm -hmm. The way he contrasts the proportions in this, that typewriter, that long face, <laughs> that arm going over the back of the chair. And it's just got so much personality. He's a master of dot eyes. He knows how to place them in the right proportions. This looks like I mentioned Roy Crane. This reminds me of, of Crane's work. It's like a, 
that, that, that couch is so neat. This is for the newspaper as well. Kids have a lot of personality. <laughs> this is later work. This is kind of how his style evolved in the 1950s. He, he died fairly young, I think in 55. Uh, he developed lung cancer. When I was talking to the family, they said that young Charles Schultz would go visit him in the hospital and bring him, bring him gifts and books and stuff like that and hang out and talk to him. I thought it was really cool to hear that. They both uh, grew up in Minnesota. They both lived in Minnesota at the time. And I know Charles Schultz was a cartoon geek too. Like he was a big fan, he'd correspond with, with all his favorite cartoonists. So Roy was out in Los Angeles on assignment for the Chicago paper. And he had a friend out there who took him by the Disney Studios. And they hired him immediately. And he was one of the first artists to work on the Mickey Mouse comic strip. And he illustrated the first Mickey Mouse book. And this is a couple illustrations from, from that. <laughs> and I don't know, I haven't been able to find out exactly why he only stayed for about three months and went back to Chicago. I, I don't, his family just sort of speculated that he didn't like how regimented it was, that he had to draw in such a, you know, he had to draw in the Disney style. And thank God he didn't stay. <laughs> Here he is in about 47. And I don't know if there's a Hirschfeld influence in this. It's really hard to say, because they were both doing caricatures at the same time in their own distinct styles. It's just, it's just such a neat, those weird feet that don't even attach to the pants. I mean, they're just <laughs> attached to the pants. That dog, the cross eyes, it's just, <laughs> and so from about 1947, I love the shape of those chairs. I even kind of like the off register color. And that's a cover he did for Pictorial Review, his only cover for, for that magazine. But it's a good one. There's more weirdness, those feet, but I love it. <laughs> those hands. <laughs> He does these giant mitts and just carves out wiggly fingers in the middle. <laughs> this was back in the 30s, my favorite period. You know, it's like a, a kind of a purse, but not. <laughs> and those brush strokes are lovely. And his style constantly changed, like from illustration to illustration. He didn't, it was always him. It always, you always could tell it's a Roy Nelson, but it was <coughs> a Roy Nelson formula. I hope that makes sense. Like, if he had, it, Ketchum was the same way. Like, Hank Ketchum would do a lot of cartoons with the Santa Claus and a lot of dentist strips with the Santa Claus. And it was always a brand new take on Santa Claus. He didn't just have the Hank Ketchum Santa Claus like a lot of cartoonists do. And Roy was the same way. And I loved how he caricatured his props, his cars, the same way he did his people. And one of the things that Ed Benedict said about Roy was he loved how he designed everything. There was not a single element in his drawings that was knocked off, that was just dashed out. Like he respected every inch of the drawing. If he had to do a cactus, he designed that cactus. If he had to do a car, he designed the car. His stuff has so much personality. I remember talking to, one of my favorite animators is a guy named Ken Duncan. He animated uh, Jane and Tarzan. Um, and he said, he, well, I want to animate some of this stuff someday. And boy, I would love to see that. He animated Meg and Hercules, which is one of my favorites. I think he did Captain Amelia, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. That girl, the, the
the holding onto his arm. There's some sort of beautiful balance going on, the shape of her, ha her hat and then the hair behind it, and then the organic texture of that fur, like stole or whatever that's called. And then the black jacket and then the, the gradient wash on her skirt and then those little feet. He's not just stacking shapes, he's doing like, like Hearst, the, on, the, on the guy on the far left, that line from his shoulder going around, like everything has a flow to it. Not so much, some, sometimes you can get too much flow, where it's all flow and everything just looks like rubber men, or rubber people, or noodles. Um, a lot of animators tend to, to kind of do that, where everything is all flowy lines, and to me it kind of falls apart. Like I think you need that contrast of straight against curve. There's so much contrast going on in here. Everyone is a different shape, a different silhouette. So that's Roy. Really I wish I, I, I want, I'm ready to do a book on him, but I cannot find enough of his work and I don't want to print for microfilm. So I've been trying to find out what happened to the archives of the Chicago Daily News. I imagine they're in some warehouse like the end shot of Raiders of the Lost Ark. <laughs> so they just completely forgotten that they're there. So I've got one more vintage artist I think that I want to show you here. I'm going to show you Bob Tupper. He was a gag cartoonist in the 50s and I think he's he's just incredible I like to, to talk about this particular illustration because I think it captures so much of what he does well the way he tells the story with this one illustration starting in the upper left hand corner with the motel sign and then down to the parked car and then the path that leads to the woman with the jacket draped over her arm holding the purse and then the guy in his robe and ascot holding the shaker and then you peer past him into the coffee table with the two martini glasses and then there's the bed right behind it <laughs> so it's this perfect storytelling kind of arc that, that comes around left to right as you read it and tells so much more than just the caption I love his inking he was great with the brush and I think here he's using a nib I like both. Again, he's, he's paying attention to every detail. Very distinctive style. I love that guy's feet. And he's a great gag artist because you need both the drawing and the caption. This one, I love the this might, I don't know if this is weird, but I love the way that vest fits on her. How simple that is. That's the type of thing that I have a hard time figuring out. Because I tend to draw all front. Like, can I describe? Like, I design very, I, I design through silhouette. And I tend to not think about what the back of things look like. Which, I'll do all these costume details. And then in an animation, I have to do the back view. I'm like, where do these now go? I don't want to think about that. Like, uh, so Tupper has great volume, great perspective. Like as, this is him using a brush. And as stylized as this is, it's still very rooted in perspective. You've got the, the oven and the, the lines on the floor. I love how it looks like this guy just came around the corner and turned his head. <laughs> You can, you can tell what happened before the cartoon. And I love that he has his own world. Like, if there's, a, there's the Tupper world. I know what his apartments are going to look like. I know what his cars are going to look like. I know, um, like, I can put myself mentally and get lost in, like, it goes for all my favorite cartoonists. Like, they create a world that I can sort of get lost in. One of the things that he did these cartoons for really low rent Playboy imitations. Um, 
And most of the cartoons in them are just foul. They're not just badly drawn, they're very offensive. This stuff always has a good humor to it. And it's clever. He makes you finish the cartoon in your head in a lot of ways. Like you read the caption, no, as a matter of fact, I haven't last hour either. You realize one's painting the guy, one's painting the girl. This is just kind of a cool drawing. I like his floppy socks. <laughs> Great perspective on that. I mean, obviously it's very sexist and outdated, but if you saw some of the other stuff that was in these magazines, <laughs> that's a, just a cool drawing. All the straight lines in him against the curves of them. This one made me laugh. It's those brush strokes, I think. This is, and this was a tiny original, too. Yeah, I'm working on a, a book of, of Tupper's work. Oh, I should mention, too, that I did do a book collection of uh, Hank Ketchum's magazine cartoons with a friend, Alex. And you can get it really cheap on Amazon or eBay. And I also did one on Russell Patterson that you can get really cheap. I think they were remaindered. Here's him using, I think, a pen again. Sometimes it's hard to tell. No, it's not a pen. That's got to be a brush. Yeah, it's like calligraphy. It's just lively. That car is cool. This is him a few years earlier. They look like Henry Moore sculptures to me. 